Hello, and welcome to this week's What Were They Thinking? We begin with returning to supermoons, and this is the last one of the year. Officially, it began in the Northern Hemisphere on Wednesday evening at 5.58pm. It lasted less than four hours. This supermoon is similar to the one from 2018. However, this time we didn't get an eclipse and as a consequence, the moon was simply very, very large. The supermoon will appear larger than it usually does when it's near the horizon, but it will also appear 30% brighter than usual during the rest of the evening. Unfortunately, we won't get another supermoon in March until 2030, and there won't be another supermoon in general until 2020. Another article that came out this week was about a person who spent an entire week in a virtual reality headset. He was trying to spend a week in the future, and he appears to believe the future is the Matrix. He live-streamed the entire event for a week on Twitch. The idea was simple. He could use a different headset if he needed to, going from a tethered to a wireless one, but when transitioning he had to keep his eyes shut. His windows were blacked out so that he could not have exposure to natural light. This made his entire life and biological rhythms dependent on the virtual reality headsets he wore. He even slept in the headset. At the end of the week he returned to reality and appears to be no worse for wear. In other news this week, an article that examined the extinction of insects and the drastic effect the reduction in their population would have on the food system is under attack from critics. The criticisms appear to be warranted though in this case, as the study design was essentially a meta-analysis. It took the a summary of a number of studies looking at the decline in population, but only found the decline in population by specifically searching for that word. They used three particular words in their search, insect, decline, and survey. Unfortunately, this already limited the pool of articles they would find and be able to extract data from. More accurately, it limited their pool of studies to only those that would show a decline. By doing this, their review had a fundamental flaw. Not only that, but even their own methodology at times failed to be followed when they chose to use studies that used a single species and the movement of the population. The Finnish researchers that are criticising it so heavily are doing so correctly. Unfortunately, the article they are criticising received a lot of media attention. Finally, the meta-analysis itself is full of charged language, something that should not be included in scientific discourse. Any study should use a descriptive term appropriate to its situation it should not use hyperbole to try and create more of an impact, or somehow alter its message. When writing for science, you are only trying to describe what you see and what you have found, and nothing more. Hopefully, through these criticisms and the peer review process, the original article will have some moderation put into it. Science has also brought us more things this week that will make you go no. In this case, a particular species that during its larval stage appears to resemble marbles. Researchers exploring parts of India found them, and although the adults are not especially interesting, the stage in which they are in their eggs and brooding are. They have no true larval stage, it just appears to be that way. And overall, the new species that's been discovered is quite curious. While strange new marble-looking eggs are being found, a species of snake that can give you poisoning without having to open its mouth has been discovered. The snake has fangs which poke out of its mouth even when closed. It also has the ability to jump long distances. This means that it can effectively stab you with its fangs and poison you. Fortunately, these snakes are common only in Guinea and Liberia. Areas already closely associated with species that would make you not want to go there. Another article that came out this week 
looked at what temperature you should be drinking hot beverages, in particular at what temperature tea should be drunk. The World Health Organization has recognised that hot liquids can lead to esophageal cancer. The question is, how hot is too hot? At least one team of researchers has been examining this and has attempted to objectively state what the ideal temperature is. They have concluded that it is 60 degrees Celsius. They believe that this doubles the risk if you drink approximately two mugs of tea a day, that being an increase from 132 and 145 cases in men and women. This raises the relative risk in the population they studied to 1 in 66 men and 1 in 255 women. While that appears to be a prospective study revealing considerable risk from drinking hot tea, global warming and the consequential melting glaciers are revealing dead bodies and other ancient diseases that they might carry. The glaciers effectively act as a giant freezer that has successfully stored various biological samples going back millennia. The melting glaciers are exposing these and prospectively spreading the disease when scavengers and predators pick up parts of the body and carry them away. In other cases, mountaineers are exposed when they come across the remains after they have defrosted. Most of these mountaineers return to the major population centres, particularly in Nepal, where they can then spread the disease. Speaking of diseases and similar, despite recent claims that they'll move towards stopping this, Amazon continues to sell content claiming to be able to cure autism. These books, DVDs and other online listings respectively claim different methodologies that will help resolve autism despite there being no evidence to support their position. These can variously claim to cure autism via things like chlorine dioxide or chelation, both of which are substantially adverse treatments that can cause lasting damage. While Amazon is doing nothing about autism, therapy ball pits may be causing just as much trouble. A study last year which took swabs from the balls in the pit, then cultured it, found some very unpleasant bacteria responsible for some very unpleasant diseases on them. Importantly, this was in a clinically relevant setting, not your children's playground or play centre. This means that clinics are not necessarily maintaining a good standard of care and cleanliness in their ball pits. Going from pits full of bacteria, we now have the Franken brain. The lab has grown what is essentially the most complex structure in the known universe, a living brain, on a very, very tiny scale. UK researchers cultivated a number of neurons in a dish and they had it behaving in an unexpected way. The neurons were there along with muscle cells and spinal cord cells. The brain cells as such began to reach out towards their neighbours after a period of time under the microscope, and once they got to them, they made a connection. The brain cells that were cultured were able to make the muscle cells move on their own. This is something normally relegated to motor neurons in our own brain. What's interesting here is that both the muscle cells and the spinal cord cells are not human, rather they are from a mouse. Overall, the brain had the size and complexity of a 12 to 13 week old fetus. In another bizarre brain study, there is a woman who is able to smell Parkinson's disease. Researchers are using work with her to identify what it is she's smelling that can identify Parkinson's patients more than 10 years before it occurs. And they know it's related to sebum, which is an oily secretion on the skin. They are able to take the results of her work in smelling the samples, and then put this through a mass spectrometer. The mass spectrometer can largely identify the different compounds within the sebum. The researchers have identified a number that in the future could be used to identify Parkinson's disease both before it occurs and as a confirmatory test. This year, the Abel Prize, which is the equivalent of the Nobel Prize but for mathematics, has been awarded to the first woman ever. 
Karen Uhlenbeck receives the prize for 2019 due to her fundamental work in geometric analysis and gauge theory. In somewhat more practical news, some of the inactive ingredients in drugs that are available might be having an effect that was not accounted for by the manufacturers. These inactive components are generally used as fillers or to bulk up the medication to a point where it can be consumed easily. This is often a wheat product or something similar. Sometimes sugar is used, and this is one reason why ibuprofen tends to taste sweet. The inactive ingredients, as they are called, are not required by law to be listed or described in any particular detail. Some are, but most are not. This means that in medication you are taking, you may be consuming something that you don't know. In one particular case recently, a drug was prescribed to help treat stomach ulcers. The patient who was taking it had celiac disease. Unfortunately, the patient was not aware that the medication used a formulation that had wheat-derived products in it as part of that inactive ingredient list. These components substantially affected the patient's well-being, given that it directly acted on their condition. The study that examined this found several disconcerting factors. 38 of the common ingredients identified by the team have been reported as causing allergic reactions in the past, and 92.8% of all oral medications contain at least one of these and while 55% contain at least one that would affect celiacs or similar types of people. And the authors for this paper do have a conflict of interest. Several of them have been listed as co-inventors of a system that uses algorithms to quantify and detail particular inactive ingredients, such as those described in their article. Another movement in research this week has been the push to do away with the concept of statistical significance. Statistical significance is the idea that what you have found is not a result of random chance or other factors. It is a byproduct of statistical analyses and subject to considerable effect by your ability to do the project or the experiment properly, isolating the issue from other variables that would affect your p-value. Statistical significance is not the be-all and end-all of research. It is just one of the major signposts along the way, pointing out that what you have found is correct and is relevant. It is the best of the worst choices. The p-value itself, or statistical significance, doesn't necessarily need to be done away with. There is a distinction between statistical significance and biological significance in many studies. A study that examines whether or not something has an effect could evaluate that it's not statistically significant for one reason or another, but looking at the numbers you may find a biological significance. Generally, these are not exclusive, but on occasion they are. The final thing this week regards the concerning trend of pet owners who attempt to make their dogs and cats or other carnivorous animals into vegans. This stems from a study that surveyed cat and dog owners and found that up to 35% expressed an interest in turning their carnivorous pet into a vegan. Understand that neither cats nor dogs are ever going to be able to properly process plant or other matter. Their GI tract is simply too short. This is so that they can break down protein very quickly and draw out what they need and then remove the material to go back to hunting again. 35% may seem unusual, and it is, especially in this study, as about 6% of the respondents identified as being vegan. This means 29% of them would still choose to feed their animal a vegan diet, even if they themselves are not a vegan. Dogs can manage for a limited time on this diet as they are facultative carnivores. Cats, on the other hand, are obligative carnivores and will not be healthy without a meat-based diet. Thank you for watching this video. If you have found it useful or interesting, consider liking, sharing and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions or suggestions below.